allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Ms. Williams. Mr. Lyons. Present. Mrs. Mizak. Here. Mr. Kashani. Here. Dr. Campbell. Here. Mr. DiTullio. Dr. Mihalik. Here. Dr. Meyer. Dr. Moy. Mr. Moy. Here. Mrs. Swope. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. I understand we have both a virtual attendee and someone attending physically would like to address the board at this time. Is that correct? That is correct. And um, Sean, um, do you want to start with uh, Mr. Lawler, who's physically here in the boardroom? We will use this telephone so we can talk into that so the board can yes, hear. Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute so that I don't have any feedback. Uh, hi, Mo. Okay. You are good evening, Mr. Lawler. You are addressing the combined meeting of the Pine Richland School Board. Okay, all right, thank you. Um First of all, I would just like to say, uh, as a former alum, I'm very proud of the education that I received here. Um, I'm here today to address the Every Student Matters correspondence that was recently sent out. Um, I am here because I would like to say that um, I am here to voice my opinion and my ideas alone, Mr. Miller and the members of the board, race is an ongoing issue in the world. Race deserves to be talked about and we should provide an environment in which, in which students of color matter and their opinions and voices matter. However, what I read allowed me to understand that this district is not striving in securing that type of social environment. That letter was insulting in the face of what is happening in this nation. Black people are dying in the streets, being beaten, and incarcerated and, in, and unjustly prosecuted for expressing and using their right to protest. Most recently, we have mergers of people of color in the military and lynchings. For this district to seek to dodge that topic is a great mistake. It perpetuates the existence of racism and creates a safe haven for devaluing students and people of color. On a personal note, I have had my own set of experience while attending Pine Mission. Pine Mission was the first place I was referred to did not occur or it just happened once or it wasn't a slip of the tongue, but was deliberate in trying to secure its superiority over me. There were microaggressions that occurred when my so-called friends would lose things and say that me or my dad stole their belongings. There are things that I won't mention because my parents are here and I am too ashamed to say them. Having had a conversation with both alumni and current students, I see the environment has not changed. In the face of numerous tragedies, the school district has drafted numerous statements of support, held fundraising events, and even had volunteers assist those affected. Why in the face of a tragedy that affects people of color is the district's tone so different? Why do black experience, black successes and black tragedies not matter? I am here because I would like to see a curriculum that speaks for and is uh, inclusive of the contributions that not only black people, but people of color have made to this country. Uh, additionally, I would like to see training that prepares teachers for topics of race that may occur within and outside of the classroom, a wholesome curriculum which prepares those teachers 
and only for conversations brought up by dialogue within the classroom in a structured environment, but casual conversations that students have and can be overheard. These trainings must address the biases and prejudices that exist, and it should be led by a person of color. Thank you for your time, and thank you for your services. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Soberner, we have a virtual attendee who would like to address the board as well, I believe. Hello. Hello, Mr. Versal. Yes. Hello. Good evening. This is the Pine Richland School Board. Uh, you are connected to our meeting and we're listening. I appreciate it. Uh, and I thank you for your time. And I will keep my comments <laughs> to three minutes uh, or less. Uh, first off, I would like to say that I have two children in the Pine Richland School District. Uh, my one son, Carson, is in sixth grade at Eden Hall. And my other son is entering eighth grade at the middle school and both boys uh, are looking forward to returning to school in a few weeks. First off, I applaud you, uh, the entire board and everyone that took the time to put together a comprehensive plan to have the option for the children to be back in school for face-to-face -face instruction uh, coming up in the, uh, the school year. And I thank you for the comprehensive communication uh, which we just received, which answered many of the questions that myself and my wife had regarding the, um, the issues and the processes that will be in place for the upcoming school year. Um, I don't know if you're able to answer questions at this time, but I would uh, ask that if not, that someone could reach out to me with answers in the future. I'd be most appreciative. Uh, some of the things I may have missed in the comprehensive communication or perhaps just didn't fully understand uh, were what processes would be in place for the kids that changing classrooms if they had to go to, say, a special math class with a special math teacher, uh, and in addition, any of the, uh, the special courses that are taught, such as band, chorus, keyboarding, and such, how the process would be uh, of the kids to change classrooms for those types of, of classes, and also the busing plan. Um, we read about a perhaps a staggered dismissal option, and we weren't fully uh, understanding and aware as to how that may work, especially between, say, the middle school and the high school, which in the past we're all dismissed at the same time. I thank you uh, for, again, putting in the time, the effort, and allowing me the opportunity to speak at the meeting this evening. Thank you very much for your comments. And, and we will have somebody get back to you. We do have your information to try to address those topics. Thank you. Thank you. Peter, you're... you're Muted. Are there any other visitors or commenters? We do not have any other visitors. Thank you. <laughs> Item 1.03, correspondence. The board received a letter from the State Equalization Board re regarding assessment. The information contained in the letter does not have much of an effect on our tax assessed values because Allegheny County reflects value with periodic reassessment. Thank you. Item 1.04, student recognition. Ms. Hathaway. Thank you. Uh, we do have some student recognition that has come in uh, towards the end of the year here. Uh, juniors Gianna Giulio, Rebecca Pang, and Anna Steresnik earned affiliate honorable mentions in the National Center for Women and Information Technology Aspirations and Commuting Awards under the direction of teacher Valerie Klosky. Rebecca was also selected as one of 64 students from across Pennsylvania to participate in the Pennsylvania Governor's School for Science, which is being hosted by Carnegie Mellon University virtually this summer. Also uh, good to know is graduate Arushi Bandy, who is a current CMU student, uh, is working as a teaching assistant in the governor's school program uh, this summer. And Dr. Ben Campbell serves on the faculty. So uh, good news there. The National Women in Construction Pittsburgh chapter awarded senior Aaron Muth with the first place 
and seniors Vivian Chan and Cameron Fletcher earned runner-up status awards under the direction of Jeff Maple in that contest. Also, Pine Richland High School seniors Daniel Prill, Gina Sable, and Kristen Vigna were named among the Tribune Review's Outstanding Young Citizens Elite 100. The students were recognized for their community service, academic achievement, and post-high school plans. The Pennsylvania Builders Association awarded cer certification to A.W. Beatty Career Center students, senior Shane Warp and Jeffrey Swanson for completing two years in their career and technical education program while maintaining a high grade point average. Uh, Jeffrey, you might know, was named Covala Victorian and senior uh, Car for Beatty and senior Carolyn Curry earned senior of the year status for her work in sports medicine rehab therapy. And also G junior Samuel Stella earned first place in the Draw the Lines PA contest for redrawing the voting districts of the state. So good news for all of those students. Thank you, Rachel. You're welcome. Item 1.05 is a motion to approve the meeting minutes for June 22 and June 29 as attached. Second. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Motion carries. Item 2.01 is an SAS FIS update. So this, I'll take that. Thank you. Uh, we have seven key initiatives for 2021, and believe it or not, all seven will have been touched on it in our committee meeting or in our regular meeting tonight. So over the course of probably an 18-month process, we're at the final stages of transition into Sapphire for our student information system, and then we are gradually uh, fading into, Tyler, our new um, financial information software system. So this is huge for a school district. Uh, Mr. Stobiner provided the SIS update and Mrs. Kirk provided the FIS update. And so we'll just pause to see if there are any questions from the board. Okay. Appreciate the updates very much and the work that's gone into it. Okay, uh, so if it's all right, I'll transition into 3.01. Uh, we spent about 40 minutes and 35 of those minutes were really outlining the health and safety plan. So very quickly, school districts in Pennsylvania must create a health and safety plan. This is a working document. This reflects our best thinking to this point. Uh, we have shared the sort of the process and there are many, many details included in this uh, working document. As we've heard from some speakers and just from following COVID-19 uh, in the past five months, uh, it's a evolving situation. There are many requirements and needs that exist in education and elsewhere, and a plan must be flexible and adaptive to meet the varied needs of our staff, students, and community. And so um, I would encourage uh, anyone who was not a part of the committee meeting uh, to begin by reading the working document. This health and safety plan was designed to explain what our thinking is, how the pro who was involved in the process of developing this thinking, what resources were consulted and people uh, in the development of the plan. And then it attempts to walk from doorstep to doorstep through all of the considerations from home to bus to entry to school classes, transition uh, that students will experience and staff will be a part of. Uh, so a lot of critical information. Uh, tomorrow, we plan a communication from Ms. Nathorn that uh, updates the staff and community. It'll draw their attention to this working document uh, for review. We will ask people to review the detail within the document prior to Friday when a survey, a second survey goes out to families and to staff. The families will be asked to provide specific information, including the names of their children. So we have uh, very specific information about what families are planning 
uh, in order to uh, finalize some of our thinking and then clarify our approach. The tentative timeline, and again, this is a work in progress that we are significantly invested in, would be to update this uh, plan, add additional detail, clarify the approach for virtual and in-person instruction, and ask for board consideration at the August 3rd meeting. Uh, we will likely then ask for board consideration of revisions to the, to the plan uh, as new information becomes available. So uh, this is a, a thoughtful, detailed work in progress. It improves every day as our understandings change. It will continue to evolve uh, as we address various and sometimes competing needs and interests of um, students and staff. And uh, again, ultimately, every time we approve one, we will share that with the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Uh, so I'll pause there and uh, we'll continue any questions from the board. I'll ask uh, one question. The, the um, And this question came up in, in one of our commenters as well. So, so obviously staff's ability <clears throat> to work in real life versus desire to work virtually is a, a key component here. At, what's the timeline to, to survey staff to begin to get indications there? Same thing, Friday. So um, Friday will be, so staff, the first and most important thing that I mentioned for parents and for staff is to read, to read carefully and digest the amount of information that's in here. Um, Friday, the survey goes out. We'll have the window open until July 24th, I think is the date that we selected, which is a full week. And then we will utilize those results to further guide um, revisions to the plan. Uh, in the interim, we're still working on it. So staff will be sharing information. Mr. Kenny, our director of HR and legal affairs, if a staff member has a medical reason or a close circle contact that makes um, return to school with all the precautions in place not possible, we'll have to work. Uh, those are case by case discussions that'll need to happen with staff members. And based on the total picture of data, We'll then have to determine, you know, how and where and what do all of those parts and pieces work together. So again, it's a it's a work in progress. No, I appreciate that. And this is the second one. I don't think I don't recall seeing so the returns from the staff first survey, right? Yeah, so. so what we did. So the question wasn't. Um, we have not framed the question. Uh, how do you feel? The question was framed in the first survey um, around what are those areas. The, the major concerns, what are the areas that you would like to see addressed in a plan? And then we prioritize that. So uh, in our slides that we've shared in the past, we have information uh, regarding what are those top concerns for teachers and counselors? And what are those top concerns for paraprofessionals? And we're working to address that plan uh, or make sure that the plan addresses those considerations. So that's part of it. The other question we asked was, if a virtual only delivery model becomes possible, would you be interested in that? And that was a yes or no question. And so we did have a number of staff members, a majority who were interested in that if that presented itself for 100% virtual. Uh, but again, we're gonna have to get an updated result and then balance the educational program with the needs and interests of staff and be able to deliver quality um, in all parts. and and. If you look at page nine again, there's an image there that shows in green traditional in school and yellow virtual and in blue that dynamic. And so we'll use all that information to try to find what is the best fit to meet competing needs. Uh, I have a question about uh, the sub situation. Um, so if we are in a situation where we have a teacher who's quarantined but can teach remotely, but we do need a body in the classroom for classroom management purposes, has the state said anything about relaxing sub requirements to just allowing clearances uh, rather than requiring you know, an education degree or something further if, if, the, if the sub isn't teaching, just facilitating classroom management? There's been nothing thus far that has, has made any kind of uh, 
affirmative statement around the relaxing of criteria for um, for supervising and teaching within the classrooms at this point. Not saying it won't, but ultimately, as <clears throat> we have been trying to work with Kelly staffing to try and build our bench and the amount of subs that we're going to have ready to go at the end of August through September, <clears throat> we believe, number one, we're going to have certified people uh, available to us. Uh, if it ever becomes and gets to a point of an emergency situation, you know, there are <clears throat> avenues that we can look at through the state and otherwise for emergency certification of substitutes and otherwise with that would have less training and not necessarily a quote unquote teaching degree, uh, but we'll go through a period of training in order to uh, be used, but we have not had to use that in the past and have not uh, generally done so. But if we ultimately get to the point where we feel that is something that is needed, uh, it is an avenue that we can look at. One more question or more of a comment, um, and, and one of the callers alluded to this, um, you know, a high school student is very different from an elementary student. So I, I would expect that like whatever solution we do come up with, you know, likely won't be a one size fits all, that, that each building will, will have its own unique solution, seeing as, you know, high school kids are can be more independent, more technology savvy, um, don't necessarily need child care if they need to do remote education from home, whereas the, the K through three students need more, um, you know, have more needs, more child care needs um, or assistance with technology. I assume as this develops, we'll see more of that breaking out in the plan where building by building, there are specifics unique to that. And there was already some of that in here where it addressed, you know, unique things about the, the K through three versus, you know, class changes at the high school. Um, but um, I, I assume that's also, you know, we'll, we will see more of that, correct? Yes, yes, for sure. And like you alluded to, it's it's already started in there. You can see K to three even being different than four to six. So even within elementary, the needs are different. And when teachers teach, they know a little one's only have an attention span that lasts so long and you need to transition from one activity to the next. That would be happening in the classroom the same way, um, you know, regardless. So we would be mindful of their developmental needs as we develop any instruction. Is it Swope? Yes, I, I have a question about the survey because I know that a lot of planning for our pl uh, for our health um, and safety plan depends on the survey, re survey results from the families and they are also uncertain of many things and those the new information coming every week. So um, how definite those answers are? Like for example, a family commits that as of now, they want the student to have an in-person instruction, but by the time the school starts, their decision or the, the situation may change. So does the model include any fluctuation between the virtual and in-person models for a specific student? And how, how will we handle this? Because right now I understand that the classrooms are meant to be um, mixed, like some students, virtual 100% and most majority of students in person. And what if during the school year or before the school starts, the family changes the decision about the specific student? Yeah, so um, one of the things I said during the committee meeting is in the case of COVID-19 and return to school planning, Asking questions is far easier than providing answers. And I've said that many times, not at, at board meetings, but in healthcare leadership council meetings, in one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. So the our goal is to create a model that can flex and adapt. And so it would be totally unreasonable, in my opinion, to ask a parent to make a decision based on information and conditions and circumstances that are evolving. And so when we ask a survey question on July uh, 17th to 24th, we assume we're going to get the best answer that reflects that family's thinking from July 17th to 24th. And we have to use that information to continue our planning. Two weeks from now, I would be stunned, stunned, if nothing has changed. So the question isn't, will something change? It's how much and to what degree and, and what? And then we're going to have to continue to work. So um, we are open 
to um, trying to address that. Our hope is, as the iterations of the plan and as the details of the plan, as that begins to solidify even more, then we will have a much better uh, feel for families and, and staff and what's going to happen. And then we still have to be open to changing conditions. And so again, three months from now, six months from now, I mean, we are we are on the we are on the doorstep of a academic year that has never been experienced by any set of school districts in the United States of America. So, you know, we're doing our best thinking informed by expert opinion. And for every decision, there are implications. So I'll use as an example, when a student is virtual, but is on the roster of that teacher and can begin to form connections with classmates who might be in person and the teacher uh, who might be in person, you can strengthen connections and relationships. As a, and at the same time, I understand the point that if it was a purely only virtual group, you could build connections within that group. And it's a matter of who, how many, where, scaling. It's a matter of just because the teacher would prefer virtual instruction doesn't mean that that's the expertise or strength area instructionally of that teacher. So that's a challenge because, uh, as we know, different people have different strengths and experiences with virtual instruction. So th this these competing interests and challenge will continue. We believe the model needs to be flexible enough to adapt. And to Dr. Mihalik's point, there may be a point, a condition upon which um, a, a decision has to be made to shift everything one place. And again, just to be clear, the one place it would be shifted to is virtual. Uh, there's not anything in the near future that's gonna be shifting at 100% in school, but if there would need to be a drastic shift down the line, then that's really the direction of that. But at this point, the experts and everyone believe that we're on the right path in planning for in-person and virtual learning, and we're trying to do so in a flexible way. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I want to add something else. Um, the, so, with the plan and, and the teachers, you know, needing to either cater to students that are all online or simultaneously online and on ground, that takes a tremendous amount of, of planning and preparation. Uh, online teaching, in my experience as an educator, is more difficult than on ground teaching. Um, I'd be supportive of finding ways to uh, build in time for the teachers to ha to have more prep time or you know more work time to collaborate, to share ideas, to build their online teaching tools to make them more effective, especially at the beginning of the year as they transition and learn this model. Um, I've seen other school districts, you know, some go to uh, a half, a regular half day schedule once a week just to give teachers time to coordinate, collaborate and, and uh, work in, in some of those, um, um, you know, things that they can do when, when students aren't in school or use two hour delays or other methods to give the teachers a built in work time where they can collaborate and prep for this different learning model. It's going to take time to adapt to. It's going to take effort. And, you know, they, they did a lot in the spring and the end of the last school year getting, you know, learning how to do online teaching or at least remote education, not, not true online teaching, but remote education. So there's, you know, a lot of prep to be done. So I just want to make sure that we are giving them ample time to get up to speed and, and deliver a quality product for the students as they come back. So, so thank you for that. We have heard suggestions from staff such as can you consider a two hour delay at certain times in order to provide additional planning time? And the so those are things I think we have to be open to considering because at some point the goal is to deliver quality learning experience for students who are in person, for students who are online, and most importantly, for students who might shift from in person to online for some temporary set of days, one to 21 days. Uh, so I think we need to be open to all sorts of things that we would not conventionally uh, consider. But I say I think what's most important is that we have about two weeks to narrow in on and, and commit to a model that starts the year. 
Because if there are seven variables out there and we're trying to prepare for all seven variables, then I could give you not just two hours, but 200 hours, and you're not going to be as effective in planning because we're, we're trying to do too many things. So we're really trying to push to understand what is our best holistic way to address the needs of our families with advantages that far outweigh disadvantages. That's step one. And we're also working to understand um, if the decision were to go, if, if something were to occur that pushes a full virtual option again, how would we do that differently? Not the same at all. How would we do that differently than we did it from March 16th through um, whatever it was, May 31st? Because that needs to change. Um, it was outstanding work. It was seamless in its continuity, but if we were to do that again for all students, given what we have learned and experienced, there would need to be a paradigm shift in how we do that. Uh, type of exercise, type of learning activities, type of feedback, amount of synchronous instruction provided to students, amount of collaborative action happening with students in their learning, um, assessment, grading, et cetera. There are so many things that will need to be done better and differently that it is, if anyone has in their mind, hey, let's just do what we did, that is absolutely not where the thinking is. It, it would be a paradigm shift in how that model is constructed. So again, I think important couple of weeks coming up here in the sense that we need to narrow in on a model that has um, where the advantages more clearly outweigh disadvantages. We have to a degree commit to that because then we have several weeks to really focus on the nuts and bolts of what needs to happen to make that, um, make that effective. Um, so that, that would be my, uh, my response. And I think that probably speaks for uh, the SLT and others of, that are part of that group. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Is item 3.02 here for information purposes? It was yeah. approved last month. Right. There, there are no changes recommended tonight. We have been implementing, and that's been a, a uh, thus far a positive dynamic process. So um, if there are questions for Dr. P, he can respond. Uh, but otherwise, um, no changes for today. The group will need to look at phase two. And so we would imagine bringing this back to the board August 3rd as well in order to look at that. And we did pivot a bit with new guidance, updated guidance from Allegheny County regarding group size. That's gone well. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, Mark here. For what it's worth, uh, I'm one of the parents that had that had to 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 deal with that uh, for Dallas playing football, and it it has been very smooth, very seamless. The COVID form we fill out every morning is is very easy to do, very friendly to use. Just a really job well done, and it's been a positive experience for the kids. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I would just quickly add, you know, the, some of the things like the order that came from Allegheny County um, just provided us an opportunity to look at our plan, you know, refer to our plan, make appropriate modifications within our plan, and then communicate them out. So initially what was happening is um, after – each day of practice, Mr. Simmons was communicating with his coaches of things that we learned so we could share for the benefit of every coach. And now we're moving to at the end of each week, he's providing, you know, strengths and opportunities. So each week we're learning. And, and again, sometimes we're having to make modifications based upon guidance from the county. But it has been a good learning experience and we can keep putting our actions up against our plan to determine where our plan will need modifications as we think about phase two and phase three. Just a quick refresher, phase two is that um, time that begins around August 10th, which is um, heat acclimation, and then we go into practice, which is August 17th, and then the final phase really overlaps with the plan that we've been talking about tonight, which is back to school time, which is competition time, and as I'm sure everyone has seen, competition is something that is changing and modifying across the country. 
and we will learn as we go through the upcoming weeks. Mr. Lyons, the, the last thing I would, uh, just going back to the whole planning work that's going on in the Healthcare Leadership Council, I don't want to put Mrs. Miss back on the spot, but she does represent the board in participating in those work sessions. And one of the things I want to say publicly, uh, and I have tried to express that appreciation directly to the 12 members of our community who are healthcare, medical, uh, that's their day job, that's their subject matter expertise. It is so comforting to know that we have a highly engaged uh, representative group of experts and who are also parents and members of our community helping to inform our work. And um, there's literally not a day where one of those 12 members is not sharing uh, research or information or strategies with us to consider that help improve the quality of what's going on. So I wanted to, to thank them again for their ongoing commitment of time. Um, and Mrs. Misbeck, I don't know if there's anything you wanna add there. So the first group that I was in, the first um, was had a um, you know a community member in there, and uh, it is quite impressive. The and and just knowing the backgrounds of all of them and how much in their day to day activity is is um, involved with managing in some shape or form with the 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 virus itself, and whether it's contact tracing, research, treatment, um, you know, ER physicians, so. Um, and they, they all have, are very well spoken and very thoughtful with their, their information. And, uh, and I agree with Dr. Miller that it is, it is so good to have that variety because it allows uh, them to be, you know, bringing that, that research forward or that information forward to um, uh, direct and, and help to guide what the district is doing. So my second group didn't have a community member in it, but again, just all of the, um, the the staff that was there, the uh, senior leadership, uh, the, the conversation was really good. And a lot of what we're talking about, various options and so on is being brought up too. So there's a lot of collaboration going on with all, if you wanna say all the key stakeholders from staff to students as well. We have a, a great a student um, uh, that is not afraid to speak up and is very well-spoken and is just gives it as it is, you know, how, how a student would uh, view or their a student perspective to, uh, you know, the delivery of the the curriculum and and uh, the different ways that students are collaborating, as we might call it, on FaceTime and so on, <laughs> when there's a problem to be solved or um, yes, so uh, yeah, so it's it it, it is that council is is very very helpful. And, and one of the reasons, so in one uh, meeting, we had experts in each breakout group, but in the last meeting, we had uh, 10 of our 12 in one group with me and Rachel Hathorn and Barb Williams and um, Michelle Schonbachler, our school nurse department chair. And so we were able to um, have about an hour and 15 minutes where we really dug in purely and directly on the healthcare guidance, what's learned uh, in different sectors and how that applies to schools. So, um, you know, we didn't feel at that point we needed those experts on virtual instruction. We needed them really talking about and analyzing um, the health precaution aspects of our plan. So again, just wanted to express that appreciation publicly. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the health and safety plans? We'll move on to item 4.01, which is our consent agenda this evening for items 4.02 through 4.12. Would any board member like an item from the consent agenda removed for individual consideration? Seeing how there's none, I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda items 4.02 through 4.12 as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? I would like to extend thanks to the uh, Hans Elementary PTO for their donation of the Fab Lab and benches. Our sincere gratitude. 
Any other discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Motion carries. Mark, are you able to go through finance? I am. All Item yours. five point, thank you, Peter. Okay. Item 5.01 is a motion to approve the financial reports dated May 31st, 2020, and accounts payable dated July 13th, 2020, in the amount of $5,382.23, and paid accounts for June, July, in the amount of $7,000,000. $881,675.70 as listed. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Motion carries. Item 5.02 is simply an information item. There won't be any budget transfers until October per Pennsylvania code. Thank you, Mark. Uh, My Mr. pleasure. In Mr. DiTullio's absence, uh, we'll navigate buildings and grounds. We have a series of change orders related to field six. The first motion is a motion to ratify a change order in the amount of 31,000 odd to replace a crushed subsurface drainage pipe. Second. Thank you for that second. Uh, is there any discussion or the, the, would the administration like to comment on all three of these as, as one, perhaps? Um, just to chime in, the descriptions that were provided were provided by um, Mr. Zimmerman. He has been working very closely with the architects and the engineers on each of these. Um, I do know that the first one was one of concern for him. Um, so they have been going back and forth about all three of these um, for a period of time. So um, again, if you happen to have any detailed questions, please let me know and I can follow up with Mr. Engen. Otherwise, you know, we would ask for the approval this evening. Thank you, Dana. Any other questions or comments on the first change order? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Motion carries. Item 6.02 is a change order in the amount of 1,700 odd for various plumbing changes. Second. Is there any discussion or questions? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Motion carries. Item 6.03 is a change order in the amount of 11,500 odd for additional drainage and debris removal. Second. Second. Is there any discussion or questions? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Motion carries. And item 6.04 is our summer project update. Just to chime in on the summer project update. Um, again, if anyone has any specific questions on any of the individual projects, please reach out to me and I will get follow up for you. Um, I can give you kind of an overview of some of our largest projects. As you've seen with the Field 6 project, we've had a few change orders, but for the most part, things are moving along. Um, we are continuing. There are a few um, current things that we're following up on with Mr. Engen, one of which relates to fiber line. Um, so we're actually looking at, there's a section of where the fiber line is underground and we may or may not end up with a change order. So I'm pulling together some information for you for your weekly update on that. Um, but again, we're also waiting on additional follow-up from the architects and engineers on that, on that um, potential change order that might come in August. Um, in terms of the roof replacement project, things are going well. We've not had any significant issues to date. 
and we did receive a half a million dollars from our insurance company um, late last week. So that is moving along as well. Uh, the roofers are working on some of the smoke damper doors at the auditorium um, section of the building. They're trying to make some modifications into the insulation. Um, otherwise, though, things are moving right along. So for the next two weeks, they'll be placing some additional green metal um, on the roof over the 2000 wing. And they will also be working to replace the entire section um, that has been taken off. Then uh, for the week after, we'll be working on ripping off the roof over the auditorium and installing the new metal in that area as well. Uh, lastly, the other significant project that's happening is the stadium turf replacement. As Jeff indicated, things seem to be on schedule and he believes that the turf will be scheduled and ready for use sometime during the week of July 27th. Um, again, he has been working on that with Mr. Simmons and so that will all be coordinated through athletics. Uh, the white end zone letters were delivered last Friday. Um, and the only other thing that Mr. Zimmerman is looking into is the possibility of repainting the track lines at some point in the future. Um, again, he's still seeking quotes for that, but that might be something that we may have to look at at some point in the future. Um, again, he's still trying to kind of gather up some additional information on that. But for the most part, stadium turf is right on schedule. So I had a question as far as the um, the windows at Richland Elementary. Just a curious, out of curiosity, are they windows that open at all that will be able to bring in fresh air? So, some of them open, not all of them open. And so right. that, was, that was in the design. Uh, the feedback we have is that they're tremendous and the tinting is of great uh, help as well in the building. So. Uh, Yes, some open, not all open, um, but they're very happy with the product. Okay, does each does each classroom have windows that open in that? that yeah, I can't remember offhand if it's every other one or there's a certain ratio to which ones open and don't open. Okay. So, yeah. okay. but every classroom, yes, would, would be able to open at least okay. one. Right, thank you. And Dana, re regarding field six, where none of these change orders would impact the timeline and 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 of you know, the project overall. No, and if anything, um, the only real significant one that could have slowed down the entire process would have been change order number one. Um, at that point, though, we did, as an administration, give them approval to move forward, so that that way we were not waiting and then having the entire project sit and wait for that. Um, but again, we were trying to pull together as much information as we possibly could. So everything is still very much on schedule. Thank you. I, I would add as well, um, if the board recalls, we received a quarter of a million dollars in GEDF grant monies for that project. And uh, we also reapplied uh, for consideration for additional grant monies to support that same project. And so we'll find out at some point here, uh, we think in the not too distant future, but additional support for that project uh, we may receive. We processed our first um, grant drawdown request. Um, I do believe that the county is actually waiting though for that turf to be not only delivered, but installed before they actually reimburse us for it, which is fine. Um, so I have all of the paperwork over the next two weeks to do the second drawdown for that as well. So we should be done with both of those um, with that first grant and that drawdown application process, I'm just not sure when the funding will actually be reimbursed. Could we, it might be helpful on this project. I don't want to go uh, full blown like we do with a construction project because you don't really have a separate fund uh, mm -hmm. in that same way. But um, maybe for August sort of track, track where we are versus projection sources of funding. Yeah. And show sure, that absolutely. Company. Actually, on our schedule, we are scheduled to do an update of the entire capital reserve fund already. So I have all of that pulled together. I just have a couple last few things I wanted to add to it. And I was planning on pulling together just kind of a very quick summary square that would show you these were our estimated costs of what we felt was, you know, going to be the project. This is what was approved of the bids plus these three change orders and then payments to date. 
Yeah, we just have a couple of big boulders that probably merit that, yeah. Right, right, right. Any other comments or questions regarding the summer project update? Dr. Campbell, Student Services Review of the Committee Meeting. Yes, we have the uh, item 8.01. Uh, we held a Student Services Committee meeting prior to this meeting um, to review, uh, well, does one of the administrators want to talk about what we talked about? It was uh, school safety, uh, return to school, and uh, culture, university. On the, uh, the point of the demographic study, uh, we were just giving an update that um, we will be sending out an e-blast to the community that kind of summarizes the content as well. But we have um, a de population density map now as well that reflects the active and um, planned residential developments. And we have our 10-year projections that are informing what will be models to move forward based upon the criteria that the board decided upon at the last committee meeting. So those things are in the hands of the demographers. We are also um, planning to share those two to three scenarios um, with the board and the community in the September October time frame so that we'll be able to make a decision and move forward with the transition planning from December January and then obviously through the end of the year um, once we select that model um, additionally uh, we had discussed our social justice efforts and our um, ability to uh, move forward with several strategic plan embedded initiatives that we had in place but also keep the dialogue open um, among the community and our key stakeholders uh, throughout the district to ensure that we're um, improving the student experience um, across the board and also awareness, appreciation, diversity, um, and inclusion. And additionally, uh, we talked about the return to school and the plans that we have um, in place, which were alluded to um, previously in, in a few items ago. Uh, Kristen, for the record, Mark here, the population density map is sweet. That's an awesome map. Um, and I think my new favorite word is demographer. Yes, <laughs> saying that a lot more often now. <laughs> well, now we need a cartographer, so that's the next step. <laughs> Any other comments? Dr. Mihalik, personnel. Thank you. Um, Item 9.01 is a motion to approve personnel and supplementals as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? I just want to bring the attention to the board that there were a number of additions that occurred after 12 o'clock noon this afternoon. So um, the addition of the four supplemental positions um, you may not have seen earlier in the day, um, as well as a couple on the regular uh, personnel matters or personnel items. So if you have any questions about anything that's been added, I'd be more than happy to answer those, but otherwise they're generally straightforward. Uh, the step placement adjustments you see at the bottom of the original personnel matter uh, is just based upon some legal standards relative to prior service and where individuals should be placed on the salary schedule. And we've had some discussion with the PREA around that. Um, so we needed to adjust a couple of our prior previously approved um, teachers based upon those standards. So that's why those are uh, indicated at the bottom. Yeah, Barb did send out an email to us to tell us okay. that those additions had been made this afternoon. So very good. A little heads up on it if, if, if we had looked at email. <laughs> <So>. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All those in favor, say yes. Yes, yes. yes. Opposed or abstentions? Motion carries. Mr. Moy, operational services. Sure. Item type 10.01. This is a motion to approve the purchase of fiber optic cables from Cablocity in the amount of $20,400 and the purchase of category six cable from Graybar at a cost of $9,413. For the replacement of fiber optic cables in Pine Ridge High School for a total cost of $29,813. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Motion carries. 
Item 10.02 is a see, motion to approve the purchase of 200 web camera cameras from CDW at a total cost of $17,718. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Motion carries. Item 10.03 is a motion to approve the application for the Act 80 exception days as outlined for the 2020-2021 school year. Second. Any questions or comments? I would just remark that this is similar to the strategy that we've used in the past, that there are a certain number of instructional days that we need to meet the requirements um, of that and the hours per year. Um, and we are in no way intending to have this replace the instruction that we want um, to provide. However, there are days that are built into the year where we can essentially, um, based on the activities that the staff is involved in, obtain credit um, for pieces of that should we need it, um, kind of in our back pocket, if you will, should emergency situations arise. Um, that go beyond what we build into our calendar. So it provides us flexibility um, and we've done this uh, the last few years. Thank you for finding solutions. I don't know how else to put it. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Motion carries. And then item 10.04, this is an information item. Um, let's see. On April 20th, the school board approved the food service management agreement with Sodexco. Uh, Mrs. Buckman needed to revise a couple things in there. And as per that, these are below. Anything we wanted to go through here? The only thing I just wanted to say um, is that overall the change was um, for one serving day. And at the end of it all, it actually caused our projected profit to increase. So after all of those changes, it worked out in our favor. Thank you, Ben. Item 11.01 .01 is an anti-racism resolution of the Pine Richland School Board. Uh, this item, as well as the school climate, was discussed in some detail at our committee meeting. Uh, I think it, it bears repeating. In some ways, the words of this document speak for themselves. Uh, but I would like to thank those who contributed in board leadership and everybody who had input to this from the board and thank the board uh, for their commitment uh, to this message of support for our Black families our black students and staff, and to the acknowledgement of the responsibility that we face as civic leaders to acknowledge racism in our society generally, but our very specific commitment and obligation to acknowledge racism here in Pine Richland, to recognize it and to make a commitment to combat it. We do outline specific actions and activities uh, which are already embedded in our strategic plan, as well as a commitment to listen to voices they may not have always been heard, and to make an effort uh, to very consciously uh, support Black students, support Black families, and send this message to the entire community uh, of that support. I'll open the floor to uh, discussion or comment. I'd also like a second before we move forward. Second. Thank you. I'll just briefly comment um, uh, high level, uh, some of the things I talked about at the committee meeting um, that um, what's, what's particularly strong in this is the recognition of structural issues uh, that um, create institutional racism um, and that there's a commitment to uh, address those. Um, and that um, because of the conversation we had in the committee meeting, I'm ever more convinced that this board is committed to addressing those structural issues 
and this is not just a performance piece. Um, so I want to thank everyone who uh, put time into making this and uh, showing the resolve to uh, uh, move forward with addressing something that needs to be addressed in our community. I want to say that I agree with, with Matt that this is not a performance piece and that the uh, having have it already embedded in the strategic plan um, the, the action plans, you know, goals and action plans in the in-depth program reviews and the social studies and, and the ELA. And that goes across from K to 12. It's not just at a high, you know, at the upper, upper levels, upper grade levels, it goes from K to 12. And that looks at even our graduate portrait, um, what we want our students to graduate, the, the qualities that they have when they graduate from Pine Richland, um, their character, what they take forth into the world you know, to open them, open their minds. So I, 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 the, I, the action plans, you know, all speak for itself. And are there any other thoughts or comments at this point? I'd like to do a roll call vote if we could, Ms. Williams. Sorry about that. Mr. Kashani. Yes. Mr. Moy. Yes. Mrs. Swope. Yes. Mr. Lyons. Yes. Dr. Campbell. Yes. Mrs. Mizbach. Yes. Dr. Mihalik. I vote yes. Thank you, 7-0, motion passes. Thank you all for your commitment, because that's what this does represent. Item 11.02 uh, is just an informational item. We would like to schedule a board meeting on August 10th at 7 p.m., uh, which would allow for any unforeseen action items needed due to changing guidelines for return to school. I'll leave that there. Item 12.01, reports. Dr. Miller, is there anything that you'd like to share with us additionally? I've shared so much with you tonight that I think I'm done, unless there's a question. <laughs> Any reports from other board members or members of the administration at this time? No, not, not I, 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 No sorry. report, but since, since Brian said he'll, he'll take a question, I do have a question. So Brian, I know this won't stop you from trying, but are you aware that it's not possible to make everyone happy? Uh, yeah, we're, our goal is to balance competing interests. And, um, you know, the one thing about, I know you asked that just because you want to give me a hard time, but I also will echo the seriousness of return to school and the safety concerns and anxiety. So one thing I didn't mention um, in the regular combined meeting that we talked about in the committee meeting, and I would encourage the community to read and staff read, is the concept of a soft opening. And that's a gradual return to school. And the purpose of that is to you know, establish some new procedures, routines, management, but more importantly, to also manage anxiety, stress, and concern so that there can be a, a, a little bit of a slower, softer beginning uh, that builds confidence uh, and lets people know that we will get through this together. Um, challenges are opportunities for us to step up as a community. Um, they're not best served if we tear down. Uh, there's a lot of, um, it's easy to stand on the sidelines and criticize uh, and poke holes in and find fault with. It's harder uh, to engage, to get in it and really work to try to meet uh, differing needs. And with something as important as the health, safety and welfare of our um, students, staff and, and community, and the importance of education, it's about balancing all of that. So, you know, I am most excited when we can go into a meeting 
and engage in differences of opinion, not, not board meetings, I'm saying, but meetings of the Healthcare Leadership Council, meetings with our staff. I love it when we get into some of the debate because there is no simple answer and we have to vigorously debate, but in a civil way, the pros and cons of these choices. So um, I appreciate Mr. Kashani, the question as intended and framed, but I will use your question as an opportunity to say that together, if we can't work through this, nobody can work through this. And I have confidence in Pine Richland that we can work through this from a leadership, from a staff, from a governance, and from a community perspective. And that we're going to get there. It's just tough to see clearly right now. And it's even harder because we might not see clearly in two months, in three months, in four months. But we will get through this together. And I look forward to doing it while also maintaining civil and engaged discourse and healthy conflict and ultimately decision making. So uh, thanks, Mr. Kashani, for teeing that up for me. Well, my, my pleasure and great, great uh, statement. And in all seriousness as well, it's, it's hard for me to imagine another school district doing any better than we have in uh, preparing for the start of school. Just very well done. I know um, the work is not done and that, uh, that the kudos won't deter you from keep keeping to work hard for everybody and just really job, a uh, good job and well done. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, so I also would like to piggyback off of Mark cause I was going to say something else, but prior to that, I have had a, a couple conversations and I brought this up at the healthcare leadership council meeting, a few conversations with community members who are, uh, not just considering, but will be bringing their students back to Pine Richland um, to to go to school because they feel more comfortable. The uh, number it was academic was one, and another was because they feel more comfortable that Pine Richland is uh, planning and that they are knowledgeable and um, prepared uh, for what's what's coming. So. Um, that's a testament to what I will segue into is thank you so much to Dr. Miller and the senior leadership team and the staff who have been working through, you know, the health and safety plan. And not only that, just with managing the challenges, the changes, the fluid changes and challenges that this um, situation, this virus has, has caused. And uh, I'm sure it's not been eight hour days, probably not even just 12 hour days that some of you have been working. So um, I hope that you do take time for yourself for wellness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Ms. Williams, do we have any virtual or in real life visitors to recognize? We do not. In that case, we'll move to adjourn the meeting for an executive session to discuss negotiations, personnel, and real estate. Have a good evening, everyone. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. The feed is off. The recording is done. At the height, we had 53 viewers. Wow. They Good all tuned in to Dawn. <laughs> Thanks, Sean, for doing all that. No problem. Dawn, sorry, I forgot you on the link, initial link. <laughs> Have a good night. Have a good evening. I think the uh, logistics of Dallin people in went pretty well. Yes, I thought it went very well. I thought you did a great job. Especially Team with Ben greeting them so that I could focus on cut and pasting their telephone number and bringing it in and not having to. Oh, okay. He probably felt like he was a late 90s DJ telling people to turn down their radio in the background. <laughs> but yeah, my, part of my problem with, with trying to communicate is if 
I couldn't have my headphone on because the people were sitting here. So I had to have my computer up so they could hear it. And mine gives that, it gives feedback. Yeah. So thank you, um, as always, for no problem. helping me out. I had literally had three screens going at one point.